turn your, in your Bibles there as well, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We'll be taking a look at a passage there in just a moment. While you're turning there, I would like to conduct a quick exercise with you. I would like for you to think for just a moment and try to guess what I am thinking right now at this very moment. Now, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands or volunteers for you to uh, give me your guess, but just keep in mind what you are thinking about uh, or what you're guessing that I am thinking about. And I'm going to go ahead and tell you the thought that was on my mind. And I would be interested in knowing if anybody was thinking the same thing or, or, or guessed what I was thinking. For those of you who were here last night, this will have a little bit of a meaning. But I was thinking about chocolate and peanut butter ice cream. And the reason why he is thinking of it is because he's taking us out for ice cream tonight afterwards. <laughs> now, why is it that only a couple of people raised their hands and got it right and all the rest of you were wrong? Because you can't know what I'm thinking for sure unless I tell you. I know that's very simplistic, and it's something that we all understand, but it's the truth. You cannot know what I am thinking unless I tell you. Well, guess what? How can we know what pleases God except for Him telling us what pleases Him? How is it that we can find out what He wants from us both individually as Christians and then again collectively as a local congregation. It's only through His revealed Word. Last night we looked at some basic principles of authority. If you were not here last night, I highly encourage you to get a copy of this sermon and listen to it. As I explained last night, these lessons this weekend are a progressive type of lesson and series. They build upon each other. And the basic foundational principles build upon each other. And so I encourage you to do that if you were not here last night. We talked about some of those basic principles. We established that God is the ultimate authority and how we have to base our actions on what He wants rather than on what we want. And we cannot presume, of course, that He would be pleased with something unless He has told us. That's what we're going to be taking a look at tonight. And what we need to realize, though, is that God doesn't just use one method in communicating His will to us. He doesn't just take one method manner of communication. In fact, he uses three methods of communication. And you know what? It's the same exact ways that you and I communicate with one another in our everyday life. If you want to tell somebody something, if you want to communicate to them what it is that you want, you only have three choices. There are no other ways of doing it. You're either just going to come right out and flat out tell them exactly what it is you want. That's number one. Or you can appeal to some type of an example or you show them what it is that you want. Or you can imply what it is that you want and expect the other person to get from your implication what it is you're trying to communicate. You expect them to draw some conclusions. We do this every day as parents, as workers, as employers, and in virtually all avenues of life. We either tell somebody, we show them, or we imply what we want and expect them to understand. Now, you may have heard this before when it comes to Bible authority, but maybe not exactly in those terms. There, there are three terms that you may have heard most of the time that people use when talking about Bible authority. I purposely do not use those terms. Those terms, though, are commands, examples, and necessary inferences. Have you heard those terms before? 
The reason why I choose not to use those, that, that terminology is twofold. Number one, there's a lot of people that don't even have a clue what those words mean as, in the context. The command, example, what are you talking about? And then there's the other extreme. There are those who have heard that before and maybe have heard it ad nauseum and they actually have a bad reaction to that. They do not agree with that style of hermeneutic. Uh, maybe they, uh, they have a gross misunderstanding of what is commonly referred to as C-E-N-I, the abbreviation of that. And it's received a bad rap in recent years from those who just don't, in my opinion, have a proper grasp on biblical authority. In fact, it's one of the most common, st- one of the most common statements I'll hear is that C-E-N-I is a church of Christ hermeneutic. That that is a method of interpretation that the church of Christ developed and nobody else uses it. That's what the church of Christers use. By the way, I don't use that terminology. I'm just quoting from other people. Okay. It's something that was fabricated by people within the restoration movement. But in actuality, that hermeneutic, and basically that's a fancy word for saying how you interpret scripture, that hermeneutic is just common sense. It's the logical methods of communication that, as I said, we all use every single day without even realizing it. I challenge anybody in here to try to tell me anything without just flat out telling me or showing me or implying it in some way. You're not going to communicate your will to me any other way. That, that is your only choice. And that's all telling, showing, or implying, or command, example, necessary inference. That's all it is. It's the same thing. Let me share with you a quote from somebody who does not agree with, or at least they think they don't agree with, this idea of telling, showing, and implying, or command, example, and necessary inference. Listen to what they said. Yes, we need God's authority, but command, example, and necessary inference wouldn't hold up in a court of law. It is flawed and inconsistent in its application. I do not read my Bible with that filter. The argument for authority isn't laughable. The hermeneutic is. And yes, it should be thrown out. I think that we are to be Christ followers. That being said, if Jesus did it or talked about it, then we can do it. So my means of establishing authority is simple. If the principle is found in Scripture, we have freedom to apply that principle. Now, I know that was a long quote. I'm going to refer back to it here and point out some things about that quote that I believe he is mistaken about. First of all, I would suggest to you that he defeats himself in that quote. He defeats his own argument when he says that command, example, and necessary inference is a bad hermeneutic that needs to be thrown out. First of all, he says that command, example, and necessary inference would not hold up in a court of law. Now, I am no lawyer, and I don't play one on TV, but from my understanding, in a court of law, The only kinds of arguments that courts can even consider are from statutes, precedences, or inferences drawn from those statutes and precedences. You know what that is? That's command, example, and necessary inference. And the comment that that this gentleman makes is that if Jesus, well, let me read it again. If Jesus did it, then we can do it. Okay, you know what that is? That's an example. If Jesus talked about it, we can do it. You know what that is? It's a direct statement. That's a telling. That's a command. And then he draws the inference that if he did it and talked about it, we can do it too. So while he says, no, command, example, and necessary inference is a bad hermeneutic, we need to throw it out, he then says, well, that's what we need to do. 
Tonight, I want us to take an in-depth look at these three methods of communication and see how God uses those methods to communicate his will to us so that we can know what pleases God. Because as we looked at last night, when we start getting into areas and doing things that are not pleasing to God, there are consequences. Sometimes it's a temporal consequence, it's just a a physical judgment that we see that befell some people in the scriptures. But ultimately, what it's going to lead to, of course, is eternal consequences. And so, this is a big deal. We need to make sure that we're right on this. We want to be doing what is pleasing in his sight, not in our sight. And God expects us to be able to read through the scriptures and figure out what he wants. He did not do like he did in the Old Testament and and parts of the Old Testament, and just list out number one, number two, number three, number four, number five. Here's what you do, here's what you do, here's what you do, here's here's what you don't do. He didn't do that. And yet he still expects us to be able to read the Scriptures and glean from the Scriptures what is pleasing to him. And it's not that hard. We just need to use some common sense because we do it every day. And we can do it when we apply it to the Bible as well. And so let's take a look at the first one of how do we know what pleases God. As I said, he tells us what pleases him. And this is the most obvious form of authority for if God directly states or commands something, we we know we have authority to do it. I I told you to turn to 1 Corinthians 2, and then I never went there. I'm sorry, I totally forgot. (laughs) I got busy talking about ice cream, and my mind went off in a completely different direction. 1 Corinthians 2, take a look at what Paul says there in talking about the wisdom of God and God's will being revealed to him and the other apostles and then them turning around and telling the world. I'm going to start in verse 7. He says, But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew, for had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So basically what he's saying here is, We're telling you stuff that people beforehand didn't know. God hadn't revealed it yet. Verse 9, as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Man didn't come up with this. He didn't think about it. He didn't know this was what God's plan was going to be. Verse 10, but God has revealed them to us through his spirit, us being the apostles. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the Spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received, not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Paul, what are you saying? I'm, Paul is saying that the things that me and the other proclaimers of the gospel are telling you don't come from us. It came from God through the Holy Spirit who has revealed it to me and to uh, all the other apostles, Peter and so forth. And these are the things that nobody knew ahead of time. And this is spiritual wisdom. This is his revelation. And we can't know the mind of God unless he tells us. And that's exactly what he's done in his scriptures. And the first way he does it is by just coming right out and telling us what's pleasing to him or what is not pleasing to him. Let me just share with you a few examples. For instance, when Jesus was getting ready to ascend into heaven... He gave some last-minute instructions to his apostles. And at the end of Matthew 28, he tells them to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature and to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And guess what we see in Acts chapter 2? We see Peter fulfilling that command that he gave to Peter and the rest of the apostles. And Peter is now telling the rest of the, of the people there, those who had heard his sermon, you need to, be, to repent and you need to be baptized for the remission of your sins. 
Okay, that was a direct command straight from Jesus. So what pleases God? What pleases Jesus? Repentance and baptism for sure. In Matthew 26, in the Last Supper, before his crucifixion, Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper. And he commanded his disciples to partake of this and to continue partaking of what we call the Lord's Supper. It's a direct command, a direct statement. He told us what is pleasing to him in that. And we know by direct statement from passages such as Ephesians 5 and verse 19 and Colossians 3 and verse 16 that singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, just like we've done tonight, is pleasing to him. He wants us to do that. And we also know that preachers may receive financial support to preach from passages such as 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 14 where Paul explains that the, the laborer is worthy of his wages and he is, was working in a spiritual work and so he is deserving of pay. And so it's direct statements like that that we understand. They're the most obvious forms of authority. We know that that pleases God. It's not really debated too much here. And so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. In fact, I'm pretty much done with this first point. Now, my next two points will take another hour and a half. No, I, I said that last night, didn't I? I didn't. I'm not going to preach an hour and a half any of the sermons this weekend. I do want to make one clarification on this point, though. There seems to be some people in the religious world that will say, well, if Jesus didn't say it, if he didn't talk about it, then it's not something that I have to abide by. In other words, Paul may have said something, or Peter may have said something, but that was probably just his opinion, or that was something that he was stating from the culture of the day. But let me just make sure you understand, and I'm not going to go into great detail about this right now, that Paul and Peter, and I apologize, Paul and Peter and the rest of the apostles, they had their authority straight from Jesus. What they spoke was the words of Jesus. It was straight from heaven. And it was not just their opinion. It was not just the culture of the day, but rather what the Holy Spirit had given them to speak. They were ambassadors to the world on Jesus' behalf. And so whatever they say carries equal weight with Jesus. Other than that, this point of him telling us what pleases him through direct statements, there's really not much to be debated about. But that's just one method of communication. A second method of communication is that of examples that you, you may have heard that term used, but he's showing us what is pleasing to him. Approved examples simply illustrate authority. When we can look in the scriptures and we see something that the apostles are doing, something that an early church is doing, then, and, and it's approved of by God, we know that we have authority to do that. We know that that pleases him, so therefore we can do it too and be pleasing to God. Okay, that's how we need to take a look at those examples. And it illustra the New Testament illustrates authority through examples in several areas. I want us to turn to a few passages now and just quickly take a look at some of these. If you will, start with Acts chapter 11, please. Acts chapter 11. I may be wrong in this, but I don't believe that there is a single scripture where there is a command to us directly of you must give some money to those who are in need. We have a lot of examples of it. In Acts chapter 11, we have such, as it, just such an example. Acts 11 and verse 27, it says, In these days prophets came from Jerusalem to Antioch. And then one of them named Agabus stood up and showed by the Spirit that there was going to be a great famine throughout all the world, which also happened in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, each according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brethren dwelling in Judea. This they also did and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. So you have Christians in Antioch up in Syria who understand there are some people down in Jerusalem and Judea area that are going to be in need due to the famine, and so they send them money. You know what that means for you and I today? 
If there are some Christians in Timbuktu that are in need, we can go to this example right here and many others and use that and apply it ourselves and send some money to Christians in Timbuktu. And we know that that's approved of by God because we see the early Christians doing that. Still in Acts, go ahead and turn to Acts chapter Acts chapter 20. In Acts 20 and verse 7, there's a verse that probably most of us are familiar with. It's the only verse in the Bible that speaks about the day upon which the Christians observe the Lord's Supper. Acts 20 verse 7, now on the first day of the week that we know as Sunday, when the disciples came together to break bread, which is a euphemism for observing the Lord's Supper, you see that in Scripture several times, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. That is, the, There is no command anywhere in Scripture as far as the Lord's Supper being partaken on a certain day. You will not find it anywhere. But what we have here is an example of the Christians partaking of the Lord's Supper on the first day of the, of the week. And what that does is it shows us that we have positive authority, we have permission to observe the Lord's Supper on Sunday. There is nowhere an example given of Christians partaking of the Lord's Supper on Saturday or Tuesday or Thursday or any other day. So we don't know whether or not that pleases God because he hasn't told us in any of the three methods of communication whether or not partaking of the Lord's Supper on Tuesday or Thursday or Saturday would be pleasing to him. We don't know that. But we do know that Paul and the rest of the brethren there in Troas partook of the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week, and that was pleasing to God. And then, another passage to look at, an example, is in 2 Corinthians 11. 2 Corinthians 11 and in verse 7 beginning. 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 7, Paul talking about receiving remuneration for his spiritual service, tells the Corinthians, or asks the, the Corinthians this rhetorical question. He says, did I commit sin in humbling myself that you might be exalted because I preached the gospel of God to you free of charge? I robbed other churches, taking wages from them to minister to you. There is no command anywhere in Scripture that a church, a local church, can send money to an evangelist in some other location to support his work. You will not find that anywhere. But what you find is an example of Paul being supported by the churches in Macedonia while he was in Corinth. And so, I, John, other preachers, we can receive remuneration from other churches outside of the local church with which we are laboring. Why do we know that that's pleasing? Why do we know that that's acceptable? Because we see an example of that. Here in the scriptures. Okay. I, I know this is basic. And I really appreciate the prayer that was prayed. That, that, that was prayed. The prayer that was prayed. In the request to make sure we understand this is not just an academic study. That this is a spiritual. That we need to make spiritual applications of this to our lives. And knowing how to live and what's pleasing to him. While this is academic in a way. We do need to understand, we're trying to find out what's pleasing to God so that we can only stay within those realms. So you see the examples here that, uh, so just some of the examples of what we do on a regular basis, and we appeal to these examples for our authority in doing so. And then the last method of communication is where God implies what pleases him. There are times that God does not come right out and say what it is that he wants. Rather, what he does is he gives some indication. Not through a direct statement, not through example. But he expects us to gather the data of Scripture and put it all together and come to a certain conclusion. Now, this of the three methods of communication is the one that is probably received 
the baddest rap of them all. And people tend to throw this one out before anything else. But I'm going to tell you again that we do this every single day in all walks of life. We make necessary conclusions. We infer from data. I will give you some very simple, basic examples of this from the real world. If we were to walk outside tonight and we heard thunder and we saw lightning, what is a likely conclusion? A likely conclusion is that there's going to be rain. But is that necessarily so? No. How many times have you seen lightning and heard thunder and seen the storm clouds and yet you never feel a drop of rain? It happens all the time. And so with that particular illustration, we understand that that is not a necessary conclusion. There is an implication of rain, but not necessarily the case. However, if you were to walk outside tonight and there were three inches of snow on the ground, and now I know that's not going to happen. I would like it to happen, and I know one, per, one other person that would like for it to happen. But if we were to walk outside and there were three inches of snow on the ground, what is the necessary conclusion that we would draw? That the temperature dropped to below 32 degrees because it's not going to snow otherwise. Again, I know that's basic, but we draw a necessary conclusion from the data that we are given. Here's one that's actually used in philosophy classes all the time. All men are mortal. All men are mortal. Socrates is a man. What's the implication about Socrates? He's mortal. Yeah, it's a necessary conclusion. That's the implication. Back home at the congregation in San Antonio where we work, there's a young gentleman that is a flight instructor. At least he used to be a flight instructor. Now he is, is flying planes for various corporations. But while he was going through the flight instruction course and training and, and training others how to fly airplanes, uh, I, I talked to him about this and used his, him as an example. I don't know anything about flying planes, but I do know that there are those wing flaps on the wings that help to slow the plane down or, or affect the, the height of the plane. And I know that when you're landing, because I see it all the time when I'm flying and I, I look out on the wing, and those flaps come up. And so, well, so they go down or whatever they do. The, the, flap, the flaps do something. Like I said, I don't know anything about flying planes. But it is absolutely crucial that those flaps, I'm going to use go up, and if I'm wrong, you can just tell me later, that those flaps go up. Well, Trent is this gentleman's name. And he could, while he's training his students, he could tell them, when you're landing the plane, make sure you put the flaps up or else you're going to crash. Very obvious. He could also, without saying a word, land the plane and do all the things he's doing, including putting the flaps up. And the student, if he is paying attention, is going to understand, okay, I need to do this, I need to do that, I need to do that, I need to put those flaps up. Okay. He has shown him what he needs to do. Or Trent could relay a story to the student of the time that he forgot to put the flaps up and he almost had a crash. Now, he didn't tell him to put the flaps up and he didn't show him. But what is the student going to deduce from that story? I need to put the flaps up. You see, we do this all the time. We use all three methods of communication. Now, this last one here, this necessary conclusion, this implication, is the most dangerous of the three because we can draw conclusions that are not necessary. We can come to wrong conclusions. We need to be careful about that. I'll give you an example of one that happened today. We were over at the Kersey's house, Jimmy and Jessica's house, for, for lunch today, and Jessica made a statement, made a comment to Nolan that if you don't eat what's on your plate, you're not going to have any chocolate cake. Casey's face lit up. 
and she looked at me. You know what she concluded? From that statement to Nolan, we're having chocolate cake. <laughs> now, she was right. We had chocolate cake. But what I'm warning you about is that was not a necessary conclusion from Jessica's statement. Because it could have been that the cake was just for Nolan. Now, we wouldn't have been too happy about that, but that could have been the case. And so we need to be careful that we are drawing the proper conclusions, that we are understanding the implications correctly. And I want to share with you what I believe is one of the best case, uh, case scenarios in Scripture for this method. Please turn to Acts chapter 10 with me. Acts chapter 10. In Acts chapter 10, you have the story of Cornelius, the very first Gentile convert. And this story is filled with implications from God to Peter. And I'm going to go ahead and tell you up front, God never told Peter, Gentiles are now accepted into the kingdom. He never said it. There were no examples to appeal to because Cornelius was the first one. The entire story is based upon the implications that God is giving Peter. And he expected Peter to draw the necessary conclusion from those implications. Let's take a look at it. Because God gives four miracles, four signs that are meant to direct Peter to a certain conclusion. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but we are going to read some parts of this. Chapter 10 and in verse 1, we're introduced to Cornelius, who was in the Roman army. And it says in verse 2 that he was a devout man. He feared God with all his household. He obviously knew who Jehovah was. He knew who Yahweh was. He gave alms. He prayed. But he was not a Jew. He was not even a proselyte. And a, an angel comes to him in verse 3 and tells him, that there is a man named Peter that you need to send for. He's going to come to you and he's going to tell you some things that you need to hear. And so he does that. And so the first miracle or miraculous event is this angel coming to Cornelius in verses 5 and 6, telling him to send for Peter. And then when we come to verse 9 and through 16, we see a second miraculous event, and that is the vision to Peter instructing him to, to kill and eat the food that was let down in this, in this sheet. By the way, did you know this is where we get the authority for pigs in a blanket? This is how we know that that ought to be served at every single potluck, pigs in a blanket. Acts chapter 10 right here. We, we, we have these unclean meats that Jews would not normally eat, and God says, kill this and eat it. And Peter tells him three times, No. It's not what I'm supposed to do. What on earth does eating unclean meat have to do with Cornelius? God never tells him. The third miraculous event was then the Spirit came to Peter and told him, you've got some messengers that have been sent from Cornelius. They're knocking at your door. You need to go with them. Don't doubt anything. Okay, that's verses 19 through 23. And then in verse 44 through 46, the end of the story, the fourth miraculous event that takes place is the Holy Spirit falls upon Cornelius and all of his household, and they start speaking in tongues. Now, I want you to notice the necessary conclusions that Peter drew from this story. Go to verse 28. Acts 10 and verse 28, Peter says, God has shown me that I should not call any man unholy or unclean. Where did Peter get that from? God did not directly tell Peter this, but he showed Peter through the vision and expected him to get the implication. And then in verse 34, verse 34, Peter says, In truth I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. Up until that point, the gospel had only been preached to Jews. So how did Peter come to this conclusion? 
through the implications of what God was telling him. And then in verse 47, another necessary conclusion that Peter draws is, can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? Why did Peter come to these conclusions? Because it was the only logical one he could come to. And this is how necessary conclusions, implications, necessary inferences, whatever term you want to use, that's how they work. We gather the information and draw the conclusions that are necessary. So let's put all this together. We've talked individually about God directly telling us what's pleasing to him and about showing us through examples of the apostles and early Christians doing things that were pleasing to God. And we've talked about these necessary conclusions. If you go to Acts chapter 15, this is another great illustration, but this time it's using all three together at the same time. In Acts chapter 15, the apostles use all three methods to determine God's will. In Acts 15, you had some people, some Jews from Jerusalem, go up to Assyria and start telling the Gentiles that if you want to be a Christian, you must become a Jew first. You must be circumcised first. And of course, that wasn't true. That's, that's not at all what God had said. And the apostles said, we never told them to say this. So you have the elders in Jerusalem and the apostles come together to discuss this. And what you see is that, the, that Peter and Paul and James appeal to these three methods to determine what God wants and whether or not the Gentiles needed to be circumcised. In verse 12, excuse me, in, in verse, uh, well, if I would get there myself, I could tell you what verse it is. In Acts 15 and in verse I was telling Brother Witt tonight that technology is great when it works and it's not so great when it doesn't work. Acts 15 and in verse 7. Peter says, Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God chose among us that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. He's referring to Cornelius and his household. So God, who knows the heart, acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. What is Peter saying? He is appealing to the necessary conclusions from Acts 10 that we just discussed and says, you know what? The conclusion is God said Gentiles can be allowed into the kingdom. They don't have to become Jews. Now take a look at verse 12. Paul and Barnabas described how many miracles and wonders God had worked through them among the Gentiles. And so what are Paul and Barnabas doing? They're appealing to various examples of their work among the Gentiles. And neither Peter nor Paul nor Bar Barnabas taught the Gentiles that they needed to be circumcised. And so you have Peter appealing to necessary conclusions. You have Paul and Barnabas appealing to the examples of the miracles that God worked amongst the Gentiles. And then in verse 13, James says, Men and brethren, listen to me. Simon has declared how God at the first visit of the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written, After this I will return and will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins, and I will set it up, so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does all these things. And what is James appealing to? James is appealing, appealing to a direct statement from God himself through the prophets. That's their conclusions, examples, and direct statements. The implications that God gives us through his word, he has shown us, and he has told us. How do we know what God wants? How do we know what pleases him? It's through those three methods. 
Okay, okay, that's an academic study, I know. Let's put it into practical application with one part of our worship. One part of our worship. I've already alluded to this once, and that is the Lord's Supper. How do we know exactly what God wants regarding this? Well, we use all three methods. In Acts 20 and verse 7, a verse that we've already looked at, we understand the day of the week that is approved of by God is Sunday, the first day of the week. We have no other information regarding any other days, and so we don't know whether or not any other day would be, would be pleasing to Him. And by necessary inference, by implication, we learn two things about the Lord's Supper. Number one, what about the bread? It's unleavened bread, and how do we know that? Because it was the Passover feast that the Lord was celebrating with His apostles. And we know that the Passover was unleavened bread. Now, Jesus never, where, uh, never anywhere tells us to use unleavened bread. That is something that we do by conclusion, by necessary conclusion, by implication. And we also understand the frequency of partaking of the Lord's Supper every first day of the week. Because we know that they met together on the first day of the week for that purpose, Acts 20 and verse 7. We also know from passages such as 1 Corinthians in chapter 11 uh, that they, uh, they should have been meeting for that purpose. There was all kinds of problems there with the Corinthian church in the Lord's Supper. But Paul has to reprimand them because he says, you're supposed to be getting together to eat the Lord's Supper, but you're messing it all up. And then you go to passages such as 1 Corinthians chapter 16. And in, and in a discussion that has absolutely nothing to do with the Lord's Supper, there we learn that the Christians were meeting every first day of the week. Put it all together, and what do you have? You have the fact that God want, has told us through Jesus to partake of the Lord's Supper. We have examples of them doing so on the first day of the week, and we know that it's unleavened bread, and we also know that it needs to be done every first day of the week because that's what the Christians did in the first century. Brethren, it's through the same method of reasoning that we determine exactly what God wants us to do in every other area of our life. The last thing I'm about to say is probably the most important. This is not Church of Christ doctrine. I'm going to say that again. This is not Church of Christ doctrine. This is not what the Church of Christ teaches. This is what God teaches. It's the way that He has communicated to every one of us. It's the same way we communicate to each other. And this is why we sing without instrumental music. This is why we collect funds on the first day of the week. This is why we support preachers from those funds. But we do not support colleges or hospitals or any other human institution because we don't know if that would please God or not because we don't have a direct statement for it. We don't have an example of it. And we cannot draw a necessary conclusion about those things. Now, we will be taking a look at some of those specific issues tomorrow. And so I certainly invite you back for that. I want to conclude with this final point. Did you realize that trying your best to follow the Bible is one ginormous necessary conclusion? That you have inferred that you are supposed to be following the Bible. I don't think your name or my name is on any of the epistles in the New Testament. I don't find my name anywhere in the Bible. Paul never wrote to me specifically. And neither did Peter, and neither did Mark, and neither did Luke, and neither did John. It was written to people of the first century about certain things that they were doing then and issues that they were, they were doing. But we draw the conclusion from the scriptures, that it wasn't just for them. That it was for people of all time. That's a necessary conclusion that we are supposed to draw. That's exactly what God implies and what he wants you to follow. 
And when we look into his word and determine what is pleasing to him, then we see there are certain things that he wants us to do. And the first thing that he has told us to do is that if we want to be right with him, if we want to be a Christian, if we want to have that salvation and forgiveness of sins, is we need to put our faith and our trust in him. Because we cannot put our faith and trust in ourselves because we just mess up all the time. But if we put our faith and trust in him and his promises, he says, I will be faithful as we sung about tonight. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. You have been faithful to me, Lord, in this life, and therefore I have no doubt, no reason to doubt that you will be faithful to me in the next life. Your promises are true. And so I will put my faith and trust in you and your work and your power, not in my own. And I will, as we talked about last night, submit myself to you. And I will repent of my sins and I will be baptized. And the promise is that if I do that and if you do that, that we will have forgiveness. We will have access to that grace and that mercy. Is there somebody here tonight that has not done those things? That has not clothed themselves with Christ through baptism? Then why not tonight? Why not do it right now as together we stand and as we sing?